So what we're going to do here is we are going to uh, go ahead and um, and let's talk a little bit about how the planner tracker works. I'm just going to restart my spiel here. Um, the thing that you want to do and what, what you want to keep in mind when you are thinking about the planner tracker is you want to understand what the planner tracker is doing. And what it's doing is it is actually tracking a pattern of pixels as it moves to the scene on a plane. We talked about low poly models and what that means. So I'm going to draw this spline around the front part of this car. Now, even though this isn't a perfect piece of planar data, we're going to get a good track for this. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what these parameters do. The input channel here uh, basically is what uh, the tracker is reading when it's reading its texture. So what you want to think about is luminance versus auto channel. Luminance is going to track your R, G, and B channels together, okay? Um, and what that will do is that will look at every single pixel, all the color information, it'll try to follow that for the shot. Auto channel is for if you have footage that is overly color corrected, like somebody's made a day for night shot. Um, what that's actually going to do is that's going to look at R, G, and B separately, and then Mocha will decide what the crunchiest bit of data is for it. Um, what we're doing here is we are judging 90% of the minimum amount of pixels used um, from one frame to the next. The way we track is we fr track from frame 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5. And what we're doing is we're comparing the texture across those, um, those frames by trying to match 90% of them. Smoothing level here is for if you have any sort of uh, outrageous amount of grain in your shot. Normally we can track through grain no problem because grain is, um, is constantly moving. And what Mocha does is Mocha actually ignores information like that because it's not relevant to the track and it looks for what the most common uh, features are, which means that we can track through things like fast moving ex explosions or occlusions as well. Um, translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective. Let's talk about what those do. Translation, okay, is going to be your movement of the track. Okay, scale, pretty obvious, going to be the scale of your track. All right, rotation, also obvious. But what really messes people up is what skew and per, um, shear and perspective are. Shear is just essentially a skew, which means it's just movement in X and Y. Okay, and perspective is that same motion but in Z space. We actually don't need shear or perspective on this track, so I'm going to turn them off because when you don't need them, you want to turn them off. Otherwise, Mocha will try to invent them where they shouldn't exist. Okay. Um, now, large motion, small motion, manual track. Most of the questions I get is what's the difference between large motion and small motion? Okay. Large motion is going to be most of the motion that you're ever going to need to track. So just think of large motion as normal motion. And really, we should just, we should rename these to normal motion versus imperceptible motion. Because what small motion is, is your camera is on a tripod and the breeze is like partially blowing past it. Okay. And so it's shaking the camera a little bit. Um, and that's what small motion is for. Manual track is going to be for when you have a total occlusion of the object you're trying to track and you need to move the track forward. Um, you don't really need to know too much about the, um, the search areas. You can just decide. Um, search area you kind of always want to leave on auto, but your angle and your zoom percentage can be important. So if you have an object that's rotating very quickly, you can up this angle and it will give you a hit on tracking time, but it will start lo looking in a larger search area um, rotation wise. Okay. And zoom again, we'll start looking in a larger zoom area, if that makes sense. Um, all right. So let's get started and show you how this works. So the way this works is we've drawn our spline. We've selected translation scale and rotation. We're using 90% of the pixels inside this to get an accurate track. We're going to turn our grid and surface tool on so that we can see what the track is doing because the spline is actually a child of the track and not the other way around. Um, Mocha looks for the data inside the spline on the next frame and it pulls the spline to that frame, not the other way around. So um, that means you can change your spline in the middle of the track. So for instance, if I go to the end of the shot and I move my spline like this, it won't adjust what my track is doing. So we'll just show you that as we track forward. So we're going to hit track forward. And Mocha is going to track the front of this car no problem, even though it's shot from another car. We've got this very jittery um, uh, stuff going on. We've got smoke and we have partial occlusions going over the front of the car. The reason we track through that is because we are trying to match a pattern. We're actually not looking for the irrelevant data. Okay. So because we're trying to match um, instead of look for the exact thing, um, we end up with something that tracks really nicely without having to do a whole lot of work. And you can see that even though the spline is moving, the surface tool is not. So how do we export this data? Um, in Mocha for After Effects, which you guys are all After Effects users, as you pointed out to me before, 
Um, and uh, that means that you all have, if you have um, After Effects version 4, 5, uh, 6, uh, or CC, uh, you have a free version of Mocha for After Effects. And what that includes is the Clip tab and the Track tab and the Adjust Track tab. And what that will export to is After Effects and as uh, tracking data and After Effects as shapes. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to we're going to talk about all the exports of Mocha Pro, and we're going to talk about how it exports to After Effects. So, if I want to take this track and export it, like let's say I want to make this corner pin and export into After Effects. Okay. What I do is I go to Export Tracking Data, and I select what kind of corner pin or transform data that I want. Now, in After Effects, we can export this as transform data that we can paste right on a null, or we can export it as various types of corner pins depending on the jobs you're trying to do. Now, um, we also have Assimilate, uh, an Autodesk, Avid, Boris, Digital Fusion, um, Final Cut, Motion, Nuke, Quantel, and Shake exports. So that means we can export to Smoke and Flame and all of that. And we're fixing to have some really cool uh, export announcements at NAB. So... Um, so stay tuned for that. We're going to have some more exports. Um, and then we can export our shape data. And in the free version of Mocha for After Effects, you can export your Mocha shape data to After Effects as either an effect or as a spline. The spline doesn't respect edge feathering, but the effect does. The effect is a little bit more dense, though, like all After Effects effects are. So if you have hundreds of shapes, you probably want to use splines instead. We also export our mask data to Combustion G masks, Flame G masks, Nuke Roto Paint nodes, Nuke Old School Roto nodes, Shake Roto shapes, which is how a lot of people get our stuff into Silhouette. Um, if you ever get a Silhouette file and all the uh, keyframes are baked in, they baked they baked it out of Mocha. Um, and uh, also Mocha shape data for Final Cut. And again, we're going to have some cool um, announcements for that later. And uh, do you guys want to see the the direct? like copy over of how this goes into After Effects just so you can see like the copy and paste scenario or do you know how that works? I think the silence means a, a, a demonstration would be great. <laughs> Perfect. Um, anyway, so we'll talk about that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a file and the important thing about setting up our file is that the aspect ratio, um, the size, and the frame rate all match uh, what we are trying to make in After Effects in Mocha. So they have to match between the clip settings in Mocha and the settings in After Effects. So let's just go ahead and import our footage here. All right, uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna check, this is 720 by 46, and uh, it's actually not one-to-one. -one. I want it to be one-to-one, -one, so we're gonna interpret our footage, um, and we're going to uh, make sure that our frame rate is what we want it to be, which is 30. We're going to go ahead and um, to put our aspect ratio as square pixels, because I like to work in square pixels. Um, and let's go over to Mocha and let's see what our clip settings are. Our clip settings are 720 by 46. Perfect. Our aspect ratio, I'm going to again make this custom. We're going to put one here because that's square pixels. All right. And our settings here are uh, 30 frames per second. So in our track tab, we're going to check our track and make sure it looks good. Well, I guess we're going to retrack this. Retrack. It wasn't looking good to me, so I wanted to retrack it. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to export this. So I'm going to take this data, and we're going to go to Export Tracking Data. And we can export this one of two ways. We can take our uh, After Effects Transform data. We can copy this to the clipboard. We can go over to After Effects. Put our footage down here so we can see what's going on. Go to Layer, New, Null Object. Okay, we can go to Edit, Paste. Okay, what that will do is that we'll put our null data into the shot um, so that we can hook things up to our tracking data. Now, you guys asked about what about this anchor point. Um, the anchor point is just so you delete it so that you can do things to the anchor point and it won't, it shouldn't affect the track. So um, sometimes the anchor point can take whatever you're attaching to the, uh, the null and move it over here or offset it by however far away the anchor point is from the track. Um, so that's why I delete it. It's not always necessary to delete it in the newer versions. In the older versions, it is. Um, so in your like V4 and V5, um, it's necessary to delete those. Now, let's say that I want to put a corner pin in here. Um, we can go to Layer New. I'll just put a solid in so that you can see what this is going to look like. Hit OK. 
put a red solid in. Um, we're going to go over to our tracking data. We're going to instead go to corner pin, and I like to use the corner pin supports motion blur because it's the simplest one. Copy to the clipboard, go back over to After Effects, and we're going to hit Edit, Paste, okay? And because our uh, solid was the same size as our comp, okay, what we end up with is we end up with a perfectly aligned corner pin. Now, if you have already aligned your corner pin to where you want it to be, that's not what you want to do. You instead want to go over and uh, use your, your Mocha settings, and you want to come over here to where this says align the surface to the corners of the image. Um, you align the surface wherever you want your object to be aligned, what, whatever frame that is, okay? And then from there, what we do is we just hit align surface, and now it's pushed our surface to all four corners. And so what you would do is you would either come over to After Effects, and you would have your, your adjusted um, object, and we'll just go ahead and let me just um, delete a lot of these keyframes. Let's see. There we go. So we have the one keyframe, and what we'll do is we'll just put a new layer in here. And we'll just pre-compose these together. I just want to make sure it's pre-composed. We'll go to layer, pre-compose, and you want to move all attributes into the new composition, right? So we move all these attributes in our new composition, and what we would do instead is we would go to edit. The point being is that um, your object needs to be the size of the comp. So there's another way you can do this as well. Um, you can actually just click on the object, and you can go to your layers inside of the comp, and you can say um, you can decide that you want to go to edit. And I want to say it's I want to actually say it's layer, and it's transform and fit to comp. And that will also give you your insert that's the same size as your comp so that you can paste your corner pin on it. And that just has to deal with the way that, um, that After Effects deals with corner pins. So it's not necessarily, um, it's, it's like a limitation of the way that we have to deal with corner pins. Um, and that is that workflow. Um, as far as shapes go, uh, we can take our shape data. And one of the cool things that I like about Mocha is that we can take roto shapes and make them nice. And what we can do is we can hook these up. Excuse me. Try not to sneeze. Okay, there we go. Success. I lied. No success. Um, all right. <laughs> and, um, and what we can do is we can make our, um, our shape here how we want it. And what we can do is we can call this car roto. All right. Um, now I'm using X blinds for this, and you pull tight with X blinds for corners and relax for curves. So around the lights here, I'm going to pull tight for corners so that I get nice sharp edges and everything else where I don't want, want sharp edges is going to remain curved. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to take this car roto and we're going to hook it up to car track. It's very important to name your layers, but we're going to come over here to link to track. And we're going to link this to car track. So now our car roto is linked to car track. So it moves to the shot without us having to do any rotoscoping. Okay. So from here, we can take our shape data. We can export it to After Effects. And the way that works is we select our shape data. We copy the clipboard. We go over to After Effects. We'll make a new, a new solid just to show you what that will look like. Boom. Okay. And what we do is we go to Edit. And we can either do a paste, which we'll paste it in as an effect, okay, which is this car roto over here, effect. And we can do it that way, or we can delete that effect, and we can go to edit, paste mocha mask. And what that does is that creates this as a spline, which I can then adjust over here with feathering. So... Um, and from here, you know, you can use it for whatever you like. If you need to, you can, you know, you can make it a color correction for the scene or anything like that. Um, so this is a very fast way to get your data out of After Effects, out, out of Mocha and into After Effects. We're all copy-paste. Um, you can also save the transform data, but that's not normally necessary. There's another cool piece of software I don't know if you guys have heard about, and it's called Mocha Import Plus. And Mocha Import Plus is a Memo World script. I don't know if you guys have ever used it before. 
but it takes the um, the cool free version of um, of our Mocha for After Effects, and it makes it a lot more useful. Um, and uh, it also makes Mocha for After Effects or Mocha Pro a lot more useful inside of After Effects. It does some really cool effects where you can stabilize as unstabilized comps like very, very quickly. It also makes it a lot easier to get our data over without having to worry about do, does all my stuff line up or do my keyframes line up. So that's something to check out if you guys, you guys seem like hardcore After Effects users. So that might also save you some time. Um, all right, so we're going to move on past all the, the, the boring technical stuff and get into the, like, the fun stuff, um, if that is... If you guys are prepared to move on. Um, yeah, right. yeah, for sure. Yay! Um, all right, so uh, we're... Do you guys need to talk about Complex Roto, or do you feel like you have Roto in the bag? I think, I think Roto is always something that uh, everybody could use some help with or have an easier way to, to do it. And I think Mocha is, or Mocha Pro is the, the way to do that. So if you want to touch on that, that'd be great. Absolutely. I just, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm covering what you guys want to see. So, um, because while you have me live, you might as well ask me live questions. Um, let's go to... Does everybody feel comfortable about doing some Roto stuff? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Roto. We'll talk about, let's talk about Spider-Man. I like showing Spider-Man Roto. Actually, I'll open the Spider-Man Roto because I have it all done. All right, so the way this works is uh, rotoscoping inside of Mocha. Basically, the idea is that rotoscoping in Mocha cuts your time in half, okay? And the way it cuts your time in half is it, uh, it cuts your keyframes down to about a third of what you would normally use. For inorganic shapes, so for like buildings and stationary objects and like, even with handheld cameras or cars or rigid objects, anything like that, you usually only need to make two or three keyframes in order to get perfect roto. For people, you need a little bit more roto than that. So for like, but again, for stuff like Spider-Man's arm here, um, we're only doing it rotoscoping every, um, we're only doing like keyframes every one, two, three, four, five, six frames. Now, if you've got a situation where you've got, you know, a, a ballerina and it's like Black Swan and she's rotating around, you know, on stage, that's just going to be hand roto and no amount of mocha is going to save you there. But for stuff like this, we can really save you a lot of time. Um, so some of the things about roto, you can check all of your mats um, as color mats. And, uh, and that's kind of nice. So what you can do is you can go ahead and overlay your mats at various opacities um, in order to see what your edges are doing, okay? And you can also color code your, and multiply select and color code uh, your stuff at once so that you stay organized, which sounds boring, but like, man, it is nice to be organized. So, you know, I always tell people like, don't, don't leave your layers unorganized. Don't leave them like layer 27, 47, and 32. Like when you pass that off to a friend or if you come back a week later, you're going to want to either kick yourself or kick your friend. So uh, don't do it. Um, as far as how this works, the way this works is we draw a shape. And we can do this one of two ways. Uh, you saw earlier how I linked a shape to the track in order to get the, the track and do nice roto. The other way you can do that is you can look for places in the shot where the objects you're trying to roto are the most sharp, the most flat towards the camera, that's important, so the most parallel to the camera, um, and the largest in screen. So it needs to be the most crisp, least blurry, okay? Most flat towards the camera and largest. And um, you're not always going to have a perfect scenario, but that's just going to get you, that's going to get you the most bang for your buck and it will make it to where you don't have to do as much work. Now, I am very lazy about um, Roto, so I am always looking for more bang for my Roto buck. Um, so how this works is we're going to draw our shape around our object, and we don't have to be like totally precise, but we're going to draw our shape around our object, and we're going to leave translation, scale, rotation, and shear on. Now, I like to use perspective when I'm trying to get a rock-solid track. When I'm trying to do Roto, I actually usually leave perspective off. All right, and it, that's important to note because what what will happen if you leave perspective on on this shot um, is it'll skew a little bit more than you would like because he's doing an awful lot of twisting back and forth, and because he's twisting back and forth like that, Mocha does really well with data that's like turning in one direction. But if it gets too far in one direction and has to twist back, um, we actually end up having a degradation of data. 
because remember you want to track from areas of the most detail to areas of the least detail. When you turn to the side, you lose all that detail and trying to come back from that uh, degrades your tracking data. So I usually turn perspective off when I'm doing roto because it makes my life easier. So if you take one tip from this roto thing, take that from it. Um, now I'm going to track forwards and backwards because you don't have to track from the beginning of the shot to the end of the shot or anything like that. You have to track from the area of the best detail to the least. Um, and so from here, what I, what I like to do is I like to animate on the arcs. Now, if you guys do a lot of animation, you know what I mean by animate on the arcs. You want to animate on the areas of the most difference. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to adjust this arm where it's the most off. All right. And then we're going to scrub between these two and we're going to look for areas where it's off again. Now, um, a really good way to effectively uh, tell whether or not the shape is moving where it doesn't need to move is we can turn this tool called stabilize on, which is right here. This does not actually stabilize your shot. All right. So that's really important to note. Um, what this does is this stabilizes around your shape so that you can see your shape on the screen at all times, and you can see how the edges move in or outside of it. So you can see that what we want to do is we want to adjust this here. All right. And now we end up with much, much nicer roto because we can see more clearly and easily where it's going off task. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, that's how you do roto. The other thing you want to pay attention to when you do roto I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to make sure that you guys get this. Um, when you do roto for organic objects like um, people and animals and stuff like that, or anything that's bending like a crane arm, you want to split everything up at the joints. It's called paper doll roto. You want to do this even when you're rotoing by hand, because honestly, um, you should be you should at least be hooking roto up to point trackers if you're not hooking up to, to planar trackers. And uh, you want to make sure that you track according to what you're trying to roto. So that means that since Mocha is a planar tracker, the best data you're going to get is going to come from various planes. You wouldn't want to try to roto the leg and arm at the same time or, the, le or the, the top of the leg and the bottom of the leg at the same time because what you would end up having to do is adjust all of these curves here as they interact with one another, and that's going to cause you more keyframes. It seems like you're doing more work. But you're actually not. You're actually doubling your workflow if you work this way because most of your shapes are hooked up to the track. Also, um, because you're using your shapes and basing them on tracks, your motion is going to be a lot more natural. You're less likely to have like popping shapes that go all over the place. Um, and that's one of the, the big dead giveaways in Roto. You can get away with going outside of the edges a little bit as long as it makes organic sense in the motion, but if the motion is wrong or if you have a, a sparkling um, or pop, popping edge because of too many keyframes, you will see that right away. All right? All right, so let's move on and let's talk about the 3D camera solver. So um, let's say that I want to start to do something with this shot where I want to, um, I want to try to get this in 3D and be able to put an object on Edward Norton's face here. What I would want to do is I would actually want to solve the shot first and then do some facial tracking for him to do object tracking. So let's come over here. What we're going to do is we're going to track this background. I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to just align this surface tool over here. And we're going to go ahead and track this. I'm only going to do translation, scale, and rotation because this is a fairly nodal move. It looks handheld, but I'm not sure that it is. Um, I think it might be a pan, but let's see. But what we're going to do is we're going to track this background. And we're going to allow Mocha to solve this. Okay, so we're going to come over here. We're going to go to our camera solver. And what we're going to do is we're going to determine what kind of solve this is. Now, um, the type of data you need to do various solves is, uh, is going to be dependent on what you're trying to do. Um, if you guys are shooting your own work and uh, you're trying to put things onto actors' faces and stuff like that, I highly recommend a, um, a locked-off camera and then add 
the handheld motion when you're done um, because that way you can add a lot of cool motion blur and stuff that maybe wouldn't have been there in the shot beforehand. Um, and that's just a really nice and like low budget way to do effects. Um, but anyway, you have to think about what you're trying to do. So pan tilt zoom only needs one plane of information. Um, small parallax needs a small amount of parallax. Well, it needs parallax, right? So what you need is you need two different forms of non-coplanar tracked data. All right. Now, Large parallax is going to be uh, close up to medium shots, okay? And you still need two non-coplanar planes of data. And those non-coplanar planes have to be um, stationary objects, okay? So for both small and, and large parallax, they can't be moving objects in order to solve the camera. Um, now, this is, we're going to say pan, tilt, zoom, because I believe it's a nodal move, but we'll see how it goes. And we are going to go ahead and let it solve for... Um, for all focal lengths, because I'm not 100% sure what focal length it is, and we're going to hit solve. Okay, so let's actually do this then. It doesn't fit the PTZ model, so we're going to cheat. Um, we're going to cheat 100%. What we're going to do is we are going to judge the parallax between the back of this still guy's head and this um, this this uh, track over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this TV track, all right, and we're going to come down here. And we're going to track this guy's head. And we're going to call this head track. Now, when I track, I'm going to turn off TV track because this gear is the action item inside of Mocha. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and um, turn our head track on. And we are going to hit track forward. And we're going to hit track backwards. All right. So that should give us at least a little bit of shift in parallax. And if not, we can actually track over here as well. In fact, let's just do that, just for, uh, oh, I don't want to add to X blind, that's silly. Um, okay, so let's do this, and let's actually use this third frame. We're going to track TV left, and we're going to hit track forward. All right, perfect. And now what we're going to do is we're going to, uh-oh, we're losing our track. So let's fix that. So, okay, because we're losing our track, let's talk about how to fix that. Um, every time you track, you're not going to get something perfect right away um, the first time. So the good news is you can just go ahead and retrack that um, as you go, and you can see if you get any better data. Now, again, that's still being weird. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to move straight to just translation only. And now that fixed my shot. So that's an important thing to note. You can you can always adjust your track as you go and change your parameters as you go, uh, depending on the kind of data you get. Now, in order to get a really good solve inside of Mocha's camera solver, what you actually need to do is make your surface tools very small. Because what the way Mocha's camera solver works is Mocha's camera solver is not a camera tracker. It's not trying to solve the camera you shot the footage with, okay? What it's trying to do is it's trying to give you a solve for the planes that you are tracking in the shot. And if you guys do a lot of match moving, you'll know there are multiple solves for every shot, okay, um, that are a possibility. So in this case, we're solving for these planes. What this is going to be good for is this is going to be good for adding particles. It's going to be great for adding titles. It's going to be great to adding objects to people and things like that. But what it is not going to be good for is it is not going to be good for full set extensions or that sort of thing. Um, you're, you're going to have to attach your objects into a scene uh, where they are according to the nulls that we export. So from here, let's just go ahead and go back to our camera solver. We had pan tilt zoom was not the right type of solve. So of course you saw what happened when we did that. And I knew it wasn't going to work, but I kind of wanted to show you guys like what happens when it doesn't work. Um, because what I like to do is I like to show people uh, the things that they run into often because a lot of times when you show this perfect demo where nothing goes wrong, uh, you get home, you try it out, and then you're like, well, why didn't that work? So what we're going to do is we're going to select all three of those. And what it should do is it should spit us out a camera solution. Our solve quality down here is 95%. So we've solved for our camera in the shot based on those planes. Now what we can do is we can go ahead and like, let's say we wanted to attach some sort of cool thing to the side of his head here. We just go ahead and track the side of Norton's face. 
And what we're going to do is um, we're going to align this more or less to how we think it should be. Um, what's important to note here is that wherever you put the surface tool is where your nulls are going to be when we export the data. Um, you also want to note that I'm tracking the side of his face and not his whole head. Like I did not make a shape that looked like this, right? Like that's not what we did. Um, and the reason we didn't do that is because, again, think of data in terms of planar data, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to call this side of face track. Well, we were going to call it that. Um, we're going to go back to our track tab. We're going to hit side of face track, okay? And we're going to just track this backwards. And we're going to track perspective as well because his face is moving in perspective. Very, very, very like imperceptively, but it's important to note because he's kind of, you know, standing there and it is moving in Z space. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that data and we're going to export it to After Effects. Now again, we want to make sure all our stuff matches. So in this case, this is aspect ratio of 1, 25 frames per second, 1920 by 1080. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to After Effects. We're going to do a new composition. All right, we're going to import our footage here. So we're going to do Edward Norton. We're going to load this up. All right, we're going to make sure that our footage is 1920 by 1080. It's going to be an aspect ratio of 1. Um, and uh, the frame rate is not actually correct. The frame rate is 25. So we're going to come over here and we're going to interpret this footage as 25 frames per second. Okay, and we're going to bring this down into our comp. And now what we're going to do is we're going to come over to um, our, our Mocha Pro and we are going to go to our camera solver and we're going to select all of these layers we're going to export our camera data. Now we're going to export After Effects 3D motion data. We could also export a generic FBX which would go into something like Cinema 4D um, and potentially loop around in Cinema 4D. Um, because of the whole interface there. Uh, we also do a FBX data for Nuke, and we do hit film composite shots. Does anybody here work in hit film at all? Nope. Um, it's, a, it's a cool, like, it's a YouTube sort of level program. Um, it's a compositor and 3D program all in one, and an editor. It's kind of a, it's like a multi-tool. Um, but we're going to do After Effects 3D motion ca uh, data, and we're going to copy this to the clipboard. Now I want you to pay attention to where these nulls are, because these are where they're going to be in my After Effects file. So we're going to go to Edit. We're going to go to Paste Mocha Camera. And what we should end up with is nulls all over our scene that move in 3D space that we can hook things up to. All right. So from here, you can use this like any like any 3D data that you would normally use inside of After Effects. Now, what is also important to note is all of these points here are stationary. But this, these nulls are actually moving in space, and then the camera itself also moves in space. So um, your background nulls are going to be stationary objects that you can hook things up to, and your foreground nulls are going to be moving nulls in 3D space that you can hook stuff up to, and the camera itself is animated. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, so let's move on. Let me just go ahead and double check what we also wanted to cover. I want to make sure I cover everything that you guys asked for. Um, we covered the uh, anchor points. We covered the camera solver. Um, we covered shape layers. Um, now, in shape layers, um, do you also do you also know that you can take your shapes and you can go to File, um, Export Rendered Shapes, and you can render out grayscale mats with Motion Blur um, as uh, out, of, out of Mocha Pro? Um, if you guys really want to be lazy about Roto, and I, everybody wants to be lazy about Roto, I think, um, you can go ahead and add motion blur to your shapes, and you can render them out um, as grayscale so that you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But you can also apply real smart motion blur instead of After Effects to your shapes. It just depends on your workflow and what you want to do. Um, now let's see. Uh, wire removal and rig removal and all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about that. I'm going to show you how to remove some graffiti from the side of a um, from the side of a uh, a truck here. So the interesting thing about this shot um, is I hope no one's easily offended because this graffiti is a little offensive. <laughs> but um, but anyway, uh, that's the whole point. We have to make this less offensive. Um, so the way the remove tool works. The reason I want to show you this shot is because this is actually the most complex remove that you would have to do by hand. Um, 
uh, and we can actually do it in Mocha like very, very quickly and easily. So the first thing that we have to do, and I'll just show you this because it's not worth um, it's not worth going um, through and making you sit through me retrack it. But essentially, what you want to do is you want to track the background that moves behind the object you're trying to remove. Now that doesn't sound very intuitive because um, this is graffiti, so like it's actually on the object you're trying to remove. But think about what's actually supposed to be behind it. And if you were to scratch off that graffiti, what would be left behind it would be the side of this truck, okay? So if you think about logos and stuff that way, um, that's a good way to think. Uh, now, if we had a person that was walking in front of this background layer, what would happen is Mocha would be able to see behind it, so it would actually be able to replace it automatically. But we're not going to be able to do that. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to... Um, we're going to show you this, how we would do this um, by making a clean plate because Mocha can't see behind the object um, and I can't see behind the object, so I have to tell it what to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and we are going to go to our track and I'm going to show you what the track looks like. All right, that's what the track looks like. And, um, and now we're going to show what we need to remove. So we're going to define this as what we need to remove. All right, and so what we're going to do is we're going to draw a shape around this object, and we are going to say that, that this shape needs to be above the background layer, all right, and then this is our background layer that we're trying to remove. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to our Remove tab. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we are going to, uh, to start to finish this shot. So the important thing here to note is that you need to define the object that you want to remove and you need to have the background track to support the replacement okay so these are both vital layers to your remove i've had people just track the background and they're like so it's not removing and it's like well that's because it's p think of this is the object i want to remove so this is what and this is how i want to remove it does that make sense yeah perfect Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we are going to either edit a clean plate or replace it entirely. So I'll show you what to do if you want to replace it entirely. What I like to do when I'm doing a shot in Mocha um, that's a remove is I like to find a shot that is, again, um, either horizontal or vertical if I have any sort of, and let me show you why. Do you see how this, uh, this metal is all corrugated and has uh, basically like a grid-like system on the side of the truck? Yep. Yep. Painting that by hand is a pain. So what I like to do is I like to find areas where it's completely horizontal or completely vertical so that when I paint it in, in Photoshop, I can just hit shift and it makes a straight line right over because it's very hard to paint in a straight line. So there's a, there's a trick for you. Um, now, uh, what we're going to do is normally I would just find a frame that I like and I would hit create um, in this and then I would paint it in Photoshop. I assume you guys know how to paint in Photoshop, so I'm not going to make you sit through that. Um, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> So now what we're going to do is we're going to load our footage in. So we're going to load our clean plate that we've painted everything out in. Um, and you can see that it says frame 93 here, but right here it says all. We actually need to change this to 93. If we don't do that, uh, it will not be correct. We need to think of your clean plate as replacing that frame of the shot. So we hit OK. All right. And what we do is we just go ahead and we hit remove from here. Now, if we hit illumination model none, okay, you're going to see some lines, all right? And that's because what illumination modeling none is, is it's just going to try to replace that with what we have um, painted. If we hit linear illumination modeling, we're going to get slightly better results, but what it's going to try to do is it's going to try to match the entire inside of the shape to the, um, the frame around this. But what we actually need to use is interpolation lighting modeling. Now this is where the remove tool starts to get very powerful because what actually happens, okay, is that we, um, we're going to match the, uh, the points here, 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 etc. Um, we're going to match those value areas with the values around them and we're going to use those as weights to determine what the coloring of this shot is doing, okay? And so what we're actually going to do is we're going to render this out and it's going to actually match the smoke as it moves over the top, all right? 
And the reason it does that is because it's looking here, 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 and here, and it's judging those values as we move over the top. That would normally be very, very hard to paint, but Mocha just chews right through it. So you can solve this sort of shot in about 15 minutes. If you have to paint this by hand, it would be a little bit of a nightmare. Um, so this is sort of how you start to save yourself a lot of time. Um, anyway, I, I could let you sit through the whole the whole render, or I can just show you the rendered out render if you want to see. But uh, let's do that. I don't know that you want to sit through the render. And we're going to find our render, final render. Wow, my computer's being slow today. Thanks, computer. Joy as always. Um, anywho, uh, the next thing we're going to be going over is we're going to talk a little bit about the lens tool and the insert tool. Do you guys ever get um, shots that are lens warped and you need to you just need to like match corner pens or something to a shot that is it's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, literally? Yeah. Okay, perfect. We'll talk about that. Come on, open. <laughs> Okay, um, let's go to our lens and insert tool. We're going to do this from scratch. Do this from scratch. So we're going to go to <laughs> lens and insert. Let's do this one, actually. I'm feeling like I want to do a different one than I normally do. Because this is also a good one. Yes. All right, so this shot. Um, this shot has a very curved, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curved single barrel distortion lens. And the closer we get towards the edge of the shot, the more round it gets, okay? And that actually makes the tracking really, thank you, oh, you finally decided to open. Good. Um, this is what our final render looks like. Playing at speed so that you can see what the paint looks like. So there you go. Um, so that's the, what I actually like to do though, is I like to take this remove, um, and I like to composite it inside of After Effects with a feathered edge of the shape I used for the remove. And then I like to match the grain just to be extra, extra clean about, uh, making my remove match my shot. Um, I also highly recommend if you guys are going to use the remove tool that you use the same sort of polishing technique. Um, all right, lens and insert tool. So the way that works is uh, in order to judge what the curve is doing in the shot, we're just going to go ahead and load in the grid that the DP just so thoughtfully provided us. Oh, wait, they never do that. So um, what we're going to... <laughs> they almost never do that anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the lens tool inside of Mocha. And we're going to locate every line in this shot that Mocha thinks needs to be straight. Well, Mocha is a computer, so it's going to give you predictable results. Everything! Okay. So <laughs> what, what you have to do is you have to tell it, no, not every hard edge needs to be a line. So you hit in for new line, and you connect the dots. And you hit in for new line, and you connect the dots. Hit in for new line, and connect the dots. And you hit N for new line, and you connect the dots. Okay, so what you do is you get little four reference points that you can use to define a curve in the shot. So we're going to do a one-parameter distortion. We're going to go ahead and turn our grid on so you can see that, you know, no magic tricks have been done before this. Um, it's just flat. We're going to go ahead and hit Calibrate. And now our grid is curved, and it's curved according to what Boca thinks the lens is doing. Now, the closer that your straight lines are to the middle of your shot... Um, and the more uniform they are, the better your solve is going to be. But usually the solve will be good enough for you to at least correct the lens curve for the plane you are trying to track. Okay? Now, we're going to go ahead and move on to our track tab from here. And we're going to track this screen. Now, even though there's not a heavy reflection in the middle of the screen, I'm going to show you a technique that you use for when you need to track screens. <coughs> Excuse me. What you do is you use the Add to Explain tool that I just used, and you cut out the center of the screen. The reason you do that is because usually there are reflections and other artifacts moving across the surface of screens. You might not even see them, but Mocha sees them, because Mocha is looking for data as it changes over time. So that kind of stuff is delicious for Mocha. You want to make sure you cut it out. From here... 
we're going to go ahead. We're going to hit translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective. We're going to call this screen track. We're going to turn our grid and surface tool on. I'm going to align my surface tool with the edges of my screen. And what you'll notice is that they now perfectly line up because they are curved as well. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and track this forward. So what will happen is we will end up with this nice track that warps heavily as it moves off screen based on what the lens warp is doing. So we can do a couple of things with this. All right. We can either export this to After Effects. And the cool thing about our lens data is we can come over here and we can export our lens data as a Mocha lens effect for After Effects that we can copy and paste in just as a just the same way we do everything else inside of After Effects. Or we can render it out as a distortion map clip, which is an ST map. Um, there are certain plugins that can make After Effects read ST maps, but ST maps are generally for things like Nuke. So you want to use the Mocha lens data for After Effects and copy that to Clipboard. You can paste this to either distort or undistort your footage. Now you can also render out undistorted footage out of Mocha just by hitting Render and uh, use that to comp as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to track this and we're going to be mega lazy because the whole point of Mocha is to cut your workflow down. Okay, um, the world is getting a little bit more competitive, you know, um, the world we live in anyway, the VFX world. And um, it's getting a little bit to where people are expected to wear more hats and have more skills and get things done faster and cheaper. And that just sucks, but that's the way it is. So anything that you can put in your toolbox to increase your workflow tends to help. And that's where Mocha comes in. Um, I've been using this tool for the last five years, and it has literally um, made me smoke some of my coworkers when I'm using it, and they are not. Okay, so it's a, it's a very real advantage. Um, and I always try to teach people how to use it because, you know, I don't actually like to smoke my coworkers. I want everybody to, I want everybody to do the same amount of work. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to put a screen on top of this, and we're going to render this out. I'm not going to track through this whole shot because it's going to take forever. But you'll notice that we're warping more as we go off screen because of the way our lens warp goes. Now from here, we're going to turn our mats off so that you can see what I've done. We're going to turn our grid off so that you can see what we're going to do. And we're going to come over here to the insert clip, and we're going to put, we can either put our logo, if we're going to plug Mocha on the screen here, um, or we can put a grid on here if we want to check it and make sure that it's tracking and warping correctly. Or we can go and import an insert clip, and we can either do a, um, a still frame, or we can do um, we can do footage, you know, of the shot itself and put that on the screen. Okay. And from here, what we do is we jump over to the insert tab. Now the insert tab I really like because it's a bit lazy. All I have to do from here is hit motion blur on and hit render forward. And Mocha will render out this insert as an A over B comp and as its own um, insert with an alpha channel and its own motion blur. And I can just drop that into my After Effects comp without having to deal with corner pins and back and forth, without having to like apply a motion blur to an effect. I just move it on and then I have a pass that I can composite into my shot. So that allows me a lot of freedom to then do the nice fancy things that I need to do, like add, um, like add uh, reflections and stuff to this shot. Okay. So that is the insert tab and the lens tab. Does anybody have any questions about those two tools? Yeah, they're pretty awesome. Um, also, did anybody have any tool, uh, questions about the remove tool? I forgot to ask. Everybody's shaking their heads. Got it. We got it under control. Perfect. Um, all right. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is I want to talk to you about the uh, stabilize tool. This is a shot that needs to be stabilized. Um, now this is a handheld shot, um, with a camera person who is just not a camera person. Okay. Uh, which would be me. Um, and <laughs> I'm just, I'm not the steady cam girl. That's just not my thing. So, uh, so I shot this footage and it's just completely clown shoes as far as, uh, as far as what the shot is doing. Okay. So <laughs> clown shoes, it's a technical term. You should look it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to track this shot. Now, uh, we're going to track this in a way that, uh, that thinks a little bit outside of the box. I need to track this ground plane, but tracking this ground plane is problematic because the dog's moving all over the ground. Okay, well, we're going to fix that. We're going to draw a spline around the edge of our ground. 
we're going to go over here to link to track. You know how we linked to a track when we wanted to do a roto shape um, that was linked to another track? We're going to actually link this to none. That means that we have orphaned this child, okay? What it's going to do is it's going to stay here and not follow its parent. All right. So what we're going to do, turn our surface tool on and our grid tool on. We're going to line our surface and grid tool roughly to the ground. <clears throat> All right. Roughly to the ground. We're going to turn translation scale rotation shear and perspective on because Z space shift is happening in this shot. We're going to call this ground track. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and hit track forward. Now, as our dog gets in the way, what you'll notice is that my spline is staying still and my track is moving across the screen as everything is fed underneath it like a scanner. Okay. It's very, very useful. Now we're going to stop this and we're going to move this out of the way of the dog. Now we can either move this, this out of the way of the dog or we can take a new shape. We can put it around said dog and we can just put it on like translation scale and rotation. Call this dog track. And we make sure that dog track is above ground track. So now as we track forward, all right, this shape, as it crosses this shape, if it crosses that shape, will be held out from the shapes below it. Now, in this way, if you do any sort of roto, um, and you roto from the foreground to the background, okay, you will always have holdouts for whatever you are trying to do. So that's, that's a really important thing to note. In fact, I highly suggest that you rotoscope from the foreground to the background, and that way you always have holdout shapes for everything you are trying to do when you roto. So let's go ahead and let that track. We're almost done. It's a long shot. We're just going to move this because it's easier. Move, move, move. Actually, there's our ground track. Move this. Move that. Keep going. Turn our dog track off so that we can go faster. So I'm a big believer in faster. Do you? Uh, I, I was doing some 4K footage not too long ago, and I ended up uh, being able to turn down the resolution at which I was tracking. Do you recommend doing that usually, or is that something that... Is, uh, I do. Is something to do with good practice or not? I, I do, but I only recommend it if you um, are really like going slow, and that's not going slow enough for me to want to do that. Okay. Um, but 4K, absolutely. 4K, I go down to quarter res. Um, uh, anything above 2K, you could go to half res. Um, and then uh, I just I usually work on full because I like to have the most pixels to track. Because the more pixels you are tracking, the more accurate your track is, um, if that makes sense. Yep, absolutely. Um, so uh, that means the, uh, the the higher this number is or the larger your shape or both. Um, so now that we have the ground tracked, what we're going to do is we're going to check that, make sure it looks good. I feel like that looks pretty good. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to stabilize. Now, I don't actually want to stabilize all motion in the shot. I'm going to go ahead and turn my overlays off and make sure I'm selected on my ground track layer. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to only, trans uh, we're gonna only fix uh, X and Y translation. So now, what you'll see is we have stabilized our shot, but you'll see we have a problem here. Our problem is that we're trying to stabilize the shot, but we're losing like almost all of our shot um, to stabilization. So what we want to do is we want to come over here to our frame list. We add frame one, saying I want this to be full frame at frame one. I want it to be full frame at the last frame. And then we look in between and see if there's any place where we want it to be um, animated in the middle. And so now, what we end up with, and actually, we actually don't want it full frame on frame 45. Actually, the reason we don't, I think, is because we're going to end up with a, um, let's check, center zoom, apply crop. I think we're going to end up with a jarring motion, but let's see.
Yeah, okay, never mind. It looks pretty good. Anyway, so we've smoothed out our motion. What you don't want to do, though, is I don't actually think you want to lock down this shot that hard. And the reason is, is there's too much motion blur. It doesn't look like it matches the shot. So um, with stabilization, what we can do what I call artistic stabilization. Um, we can take down the amount of stabilization we want. So we're going to stabilize every three frames instead of every ten. And now we've kept some of that nice handheld motion, but we've smoothed out the shot to where it doesn't look like a complete amateur shot it. So that's how you can start to do um, some really cool tricks uh, inside of our stabilize tool. Another thing you can do uh, with stabilization that is fun is you can come over here and you can change the... Um, the narrative of a shot. So what I mean by that is I have here this shot that's handheld of this dad and his kid, right? And I have two different tracks. I can nail down this shot so that the dad and the kid are being very serious and like you don't feel, you feel outside of the shot now as opposed to inside of the shot, right? Or I can try to change the focal point of the shot more to this kid by tracking the kid's face, and I can move the shot around the kid himself. Now, the cool thing about this is uh, I've used this very same technique to sort of save a documentary. There was, um, I was, I was up in San Francisco, and this guy had shot a documentary. His camera guy was very new and very tired. It was the end of the day, and they'd shot this very serious story, and it didn't the camera motion didn't match the narrative. The story they were trying to tell was a serious one, and the camera was moving all over the place. So what we did is there was there was nothing in the room that we could track that was appropriate to focus on. Uh, so instead, we tracked his face, and we did that same thing where we smoothed it out. Instead of using 10 frames, we went down to like three. Okay? And we still kept some of the motion, but we ended up saving the shots. So that's the that's the kind of stuff you need to think about um, with our stabilization. Now you can lock down a shot with our stabilization as I showed you, but I don't think that's where it really shines. I think where Mocha's tracker shines for stabilization is artistic stabilization when you want to change the narrative or tell a story inside of your shot. Um, and that I think is all of our modules. So um, you can render this out of Mocha Pro. And again, um, the modules that come free with Mocha for After Effects are the Clip tab, the Track tab, the Adjust Track tab. Um, if you buy the Mocha for After Effects upgrade, it's the Clip tab, the Lens tab, the Track tab, Adjust Track, and the Camera Solver, which are all nice on their own. Um, Mocha Pro has the Insert, the Remove, the Stabilize. It exports to everything, you know, and it also renders out uh, objects with motion blur. And, uh, and it renders out clips and paint work. So that's a breakdown of our stuff. Does anybody have any questions? No, that was, yeah. Uh, somebody just kind of set us off with that. It was a nice overview, and I have to agree. You did a fantastic job, and we really do appreciate the time you took uh, to spend uh, this evening with us. Sounds great. Um, you have a wonderful evening, guys, and thank you so much for your time. You too. Thank you. Bye now. All right, bye.